Great. Um, hi, everyone. To those who don't know me, my name is Alper. I'm the Education Content Manager for this year's Code Day, Code Day Labs. I'm happy to welcome Christina to our talk today. Uh, and Christina will be talking to you guys about how to increase your value as an engineer in the tech and CS field. So, Christina, if you'd like to introduce yourself a little more and get started with the talk, that would be great. Awesome. Thank you, Alper. Of course. Um, well, I'm Cristina Nista. I was born in Romania. I studied computer science and I started my adventure in IT 17 years ago in Mexico. Why Mexico, you might ask? Well, um, I've always loved to travel, but as a young graduate, I was broke. <laughs> So when I got this internship to um, this Mexican company, well, my dream came true. I could travel the other side of the world uh, while working to finance my adventures. And I became a digital nomad. I got to do skydiving in Isengard, <laughs> New Zealand, you know, where Lord of the Rings were shot. Um, I got to climb a, a volcano. I got to uh, change myself, charge myself with the engine, uh, energy on the pyramid of sun. You know, I got to circle the world in 90 days. And um, all the while I've been working in developing my professional career. And, and now I am uh, the director of operations at Tesco. Tesco is a company that does software testing. Uh, and uh, in this role, I had the opportunity to implement a home office environment where everybody could live the life they love, either spend uh, their time with uh, family or travel around the world. Um, today, I want to share with you some of the things that I learned over my 17 years uh, of work adventure. And uh, I'm, I also am going to include some of the things that I learned the hard way. <laughs> there are many of us who believe that uh, being irreplaceable is a good thing. I myself fell into this trap a while back. Uh, when I started as a manager, I was controlling, uh, you know, no one could make decisions without my approval. And um, because I was very good at planning and getting things done, I did not trust others to do it. Um, and I also believed that the company could not replace me because I made myself indispensable. All decisions uh, depended on me. Uh, no one else knew how to do certain things and I made sure <laughs> no one else knew how to do those things. So, you know, to create that dependency uh, on me, um, and, and I thought that that gave me power. Um, I felt significant, people needed me, others depended on me, and, and I have to admit, um, I had the feeling of being superior, better than others, uh, a bit arrogant, you would say, you are not wrong. <laughs> um, and all these uh, benefits that I was, benefits that I thought that I had, um, were fulfilling my ego. On the other side, all this came with a cost. I had to work extra weekends. Well, my husband was not uh, happy at all with it. But, you know, I thought to myself that it's okay because I was justifying myself saying, okay, sacrificing for, I'm sacrificing for the great, the good, that's, that's, that's okay. Um, in reality, what I was doing was, uh, all of this was from uh, uh, preservation. Um, if somebody came around, uh, somebody who could do what I was doing, I felt that my job was being threatened. And all with good reason, um, just because you think you are indispensable does not mean you have a secure job. Later in my career as a director of operations, I realized that having people like I used to be, you know, irreplaceable is not good for business because they are limiting the growth of the company and they create bottlenecks in the operation. Bottleneck. So think about a bottleneck as a place where the road becomes narrow so that the traffic slows down or stops 
even causing traffic jams. Um, a while back, I, I uh, had a colleague that was pretty good at what he was doing. Um, and he was the only one who had uh, the knowledge uh, and the experience to working on some of the uh, reports of, uh, of our customer. And uh, several times we asked him to train somebody else and, uh, um, you know, thinking to be ready if something happens. Um, but he refused and always had an excuse, uh, either it was you know, he had a lot of work to do, no time for that, or it was too simple, he would handle it all the time. And um, of course, what, what we didn't want to happen happened while he was on vacation. <laughs> the client wanted those reports and uh, we, nobody in the team knew how to, how to create those. And uh, we bothered him during vacation and, and you know, guess what? He didn't want to help. <laughs> And uh, well, we, we struggled uh, among the uh, team members. Finally, we figured out how to, how to solve this. And well, something that usually took a couple of hours, now it took us a couple of days, and, but we finally got it out. Um, the client was not happy, but well, at least we delivered. And um, if you see this situation from a business perspective, this is a business risk. It's actually, it actually has a name. It's called concentration risk. Being irreplaceable gives you the false sense that your job is secure. But in reality, what happens behind the scenes, it's a different story. You know? Because effective managers always work actively to eliminate such bottlenecks and reduce such risks. So what happened with our colleague? Well, a few months later, you know, the company figured out how to learn everything that he didn't want to teach others and, and uh, they fired him. Um, yeah, another example, I'm currently working with, uh, with a customer that um, they have nine teams, uh, nine development teams, and uh, one release uh, management team. And um, the, the problem is that, you know, the product, the, the system, it's, it's quite big and, and uh, handling all the release management required a lot of knowledge of the whole system, not just the pieces of it. And um, uh, it was, uh, uh, you really needed very experienced engineers to, to do that job. Um, the team, in this team, they had uh, four people. And uh, well, the, the problem is that was that um, if one of these guys, you know, um, got sick or went on vacation, all the company was uh, uh, slowing down their, their releases and uh, could uh, you know, uh, miss on uh, uh, deadlines or uh, fulfilling expectations from the customers. So all, all the, um, uh, this was a bottleneck, all the, uh, all the knowledge that this um, um, uh, process required was, was concentrated in four, pe four people. And, and of course, the, the business realized that and um, now they moved to a continuous deployment uh, process and they implemented DevOps working, um, they worked about a year in, in implementing all this, all with the purpose of eliminating this bottleneck and uh, um, making sure that uh, now they can bring other people in the team that don't require so much expertise and so much knowledge to be able to do the work. So if we should not make ourselves indispensable, then how are we going to distinguish ourselves? Don't be replaceable, be invaluable. Become a value-driven professional because companies want to hire people that generate more value for them and for their customers. Here are some uh, characteristics of value-driven professionals. 
They add value in everything they do. They take ownership and accountability, solve problems, they don't create them. <laughs> they set and achieve goals and they adopt a growth mindset. So let's go one by one and, and um, discuss them. Add value in everything you do. To understand this one, we have to understand what value is. So value is generated when benefits exceed the price. Companies do not hire people to fill in a position. Companies hire people to generate more value for their customers so the customers pay them in return. You know, people who thrive in their careers see themselves as an economic product. Now, what is an economic product? For example, if you buy a stock, you are hoping that stock increases in value over time. So when you sell it, you will make more money. So as an economic product, you want to see um, you want to see yourself as an investment that people are making in order to get themselves a return. Are people economic products? Well, of course not. You know, people are priceless. Your friends and family will never put an economic value on you. But the reality is that in the business world, this is how you are seen. And actually, that is not such a bad thing because you get to control your economic value. Nobody else gets to do it. You control it. So every paycheck that you get is an investment that someone has made hoping to get a great return on their investment. And if you understand that, and if you focus on adding value in everything you do, your career will be just fine. In IT, in, in our work context, you now generating more value means the ability to solve bigger problems. People are not paid just for what they do. They are paid for the size of the problem they can solve. You'll make more money when you'll be able to solve bigger problems and for more people. If you are a better investment for a company, well, just like in a stock, you know, if a stock performs well, you put more money in it. Well, it's the same thing in companies. If you are a better investment for the company, they will invest more in you. So be obsessed with giving people a great return on their investment. Take ownership and accountability. Value-driven professional do not play the role of a victim. In any story or movie, the victim is a person who needs to be rescued, right? It's, uh, it's hopeless, he has given up, he doesn't know what to do, how to do, and he needs a hero to come and save him. So playing the victim has its benefits. You know, the people around you will pity you, you don't have to take responsibility for things. You know that the problems are someone else's fault. And when something is difficult, you get somebody else to do it. You know, since you're a victim and you cannot do it. But there is also a downsize. You know, sooner or later, people will learn your game. And they will get tired of helping you because they will want you to own your responsibilities. And having in a team victims, oh, it's exhausting. It's just exhausting. So refuse to play the victim. Take initiative on the problems and, and take responsibilities and, and, and solving them. You now, as a hero in a story, you know, they take ownership and accountability despite the problems that they are facing. And actually, the more you overcome them, you know, the more heroic the story will be. Imagine how the story of Frodo in Lord of the Rings would have evolved if Frodo played the victim role. 
when even when he was afraid, he had doubts and he was ill prepared for the challenge. He did not resign. He did not blame others or the world. He embraced the challenge. So what does it mean to take ownership at work? Taking ownership, it's about taking initiative. We take ownership when we believe that taking action is not someone else's responsibility. Even when we are working with others, you are responsible of the quality and the timeliness of your outcomes. It does not mean that you have to own the project as a project manager would, and it doesn't mean that you shouldn't involve others. It does mean that you have an obligation to the result of the team, and you also have an obligation to act when up items are impacted uh, are impacting those results. You know, perhaps you have an excellent idea of saving time, but it's not in your scope of work. Uh, or maybe you don't have enough time to finish the assignments that you have, uh, or you don't have enough resources to complete the task, or, or the fix lies somewhere else in, in the organization. In all these situations, taking ownership means bringing the idea forward to somebody who can act on them, you know, who has the time, who has the resources to get the stuff done. So taking ownership actually tells others that, you know, they can trust you to do the right thing. It is a choice. Being accountable is not just about being respons a responsible person. It's about being responsible of the results. You know, if ownership, it's about taking initiative, accountability, it's about follow through. It's not just about your goals or your commitments. It's about acknowledging that your actions affect our team members' ability to accomplish their goals. So when you say, I've got this, accountability means that you will deliver as promised on time within budget. It also means that you are coming forward when you fell short, you know, if you cannot deliver on time or the results will not be as strong as you'd hoped. Be honest and proactive with your communication about the situation. By being forthcoming, you respect the impact you have on your teammates. And that generates trust. Being accountable tells others, you can trust me to do what I say I'm going to do. Sorry, okay. The third characteristic of highly valued professionals is that they solve problems. They don't create them. Now, value-driven professionals are not victims. <laughs> we already talked about that. A victim is a problem. They don't take ownership. They don't take accountability. Someone else has to do the things for them. So these kind of people, instead of helping the team, they slow it down. They drain its energy and saps its momentum. Second, trauma. Trauma is overreaction. Overreaction to problems, overreaction to comments our people make, conflict. It's all about attracting attention to yourself. But, uh, you know, if attention is focused on you, it is not focused on the objectives of the team or the objectives of the company. So even if you personally have the benefit of attractive atten attracting attention and be the center of attention, there is a cost to it. You do not generate respect and you do not generate trust. And over time, people get tired of drama queens. 
So value-driven professionals are focused on eliminating waste. What is waste? Different, different things, wasting time, wasting materials, rework. This is a big one in our industry. Defects are rework. Defects are waste. You know, all the time that you have to go and you, a lot of people spend in fixing defects and retesting in, in making sure that, you know, the fix didn't break something that already worked. So all that is rework and it's waste. So work on eliminating waste, become efficient. Value-driven professionals are problem solvers. And, you know, if you are given a difficult problem to solve, be happy about it. Because this means that you are more trusted and you are worth more to the people, to the team and to the company. Embrace the problems and go solve them. Value-driven professionals are not afraid of challenges whatever wherever it comes you know they they embrace it and um just get them solved sometimes you know um people are um afraid of of the challenges that work can represent but you know being courageous it does not mean you are not afraid it means that you act despite being afraid. So be courageous about the challenges that present on your way. They are just obstacles that need to be overcome. Value-driven professional expect conflict. You know, many people are afraid of conflict and they avoid it. Um, even if it means for them to just, you know, um, shut up and do nothing about it or, you know, just, you know, get along with, with what other people do or um, the, the things that you don't like. Um, and, um, and all these just trying to, to maintain a, a peaceful environment. Well, Conflict, it's natural. We often will face conflict of all sorts. You know, for example, unfulfilled expectations. You have a vendor that did not deliver on time. You will face colleagues that have low performance. Uh, oh, very common, <laughs> it's going to be miscommunication and, and misunderstandings. Conflict doesn't not necessarily have to be related to people. It can be related to, you know, budget problems or deadlines. But conflict, it's natural. It's, it's a byproduct of collaboration, of, of um, work, of progress. So it's better to learn how to deal with conflict the right way. And, you know, how to be calm in stressful situations, how to de-escalate the tension and, you know, get things done. It's not bad. It, it, is, it is a byproduct of, of work and progress. Now, conflict can increase when your ego steps in or you get hijacked by your emotions. You know, when you want to control people to prove that you're right. When, when you know, you want to um, show you are better than others. You know, in th those moments, you do not really listen to people. You do not really, you are not open to their ideas because you want to impose your will. When you let your emotion drive you, you know, you, 
you get angry and, and you stop reasoning. You stop thinking about the impact that your actions and your words have on other people. In all these situations, it, you are actually going to increase the conflict. And, um, you know, often when I, I make decisions, people, people come to me to discuss and propose other things. And, and I have to admit, my first instinct is to use my authority and impose my will. But um, the, the things that stops me is, is that I think maybe perhaps they are right. And, and I think that um, I should listen to them before I, I uh, dismiss their, their um, proposals. And, and I found out that uh, actually it is okay to change your mind once you have more information. People have um, appreciated when they were, I was open to listen to their um, ideas and I was actually acknowledged, in, acknowledged them that they had a better idea than mine and, and that we should change the course of action to implement things the way they were proposing. So don't wish that there is no conflict. Instead, wish that you become better at handling conflict. The fourth characteristic of uh, value-driven professionals is that they set and achieve goals. You probably heard of uh, the famous quote, um, he who fails to plan is planning to fail was Winston Churchill that said it. In order to generate value, you need to clearly understand the problem that needs to be solved and what the goal is. Now the SMART format is a very, uh, it's a very good one. Uh, it helps bring this clarity to, to what uh, needs to be achieved. SMART stands for specific, measurable, um, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Um, once you have a clear goal, do the plan. How are you going to achieve the goal? Failing to plan is planning to fail. So the value is not in the plan you are going to create, you know, the, the paper, the, the document. The value, it's in the planning, the thinking you'll put behind the plan. You know, what are the activities that you have to do? What are the resources that you will need? What are the resources that you have at your disposal? You know, what could go wrong with this? You know, how can I mitigate all the issues that I'm seeing? What are the dependencies that I have, and et cetera? And once you have a plan, act on it. You know, a beautiful goal and its plan are useless without action. So get things done. You will need to be disciplined about executing the plan. Um, I actually have a, an entire presentation about this topic. If somebody is interested in, in knowing about uh, some uh, uh, tools to achieving your goals, just drop me a message to, to my uh, email and I will share it with you. All right, the fifth characteristic, it's a growth mindset. Carol Dweck, it's a professor at Stanford, and the author of the book called Mindset coined this term. She discovered that there are basically two kinds of ways to look at personal development and in general, the world. People that have a growth mindset and people that have a fixed mindset. Although very simplistic, it is a very powerful concept and, and let's see why. She discovered that people who possess a fixed mindset think of their identities like something that can never change since they believe they are fixed. You know, their intelligence, their personality and, and character do not change in, from their point of view. This kind of person will say, 
I don't do math well. Or, and that rather than I've not studied math to be good at math. They just believe I'm not good at math and I cannot change that. That's what it is. It's very common that you, well, you will see that they do not like criticism. And actually they become defensive because they don't believe that they can fix it. You know, this would mean that their supposed perceived ability is not as good as they think. Likewise, they do not like to try new things because they risk to discover they are not good at it and their ability will be compromised. For the same reason, they believe that making an effort, it's, it's bad, you know, after all, if you have to work hard to achieve something, it's because you're not good at it. What, what made this possible? Well, having been told words like, you are good at this, and this is not your thing, by our parents, by our teachers, helped create this fixed mindset. On the other hand, people with a growth mindset believe that they can do anything. <laughs> if they put their mind to it, they put the effort, the hours, they are capable of achieving anything that they want. And they're constantly evolving. They like to learn because learning is uh, the key to grow and grow is the key to success. So they learn from everybody from uh, people that they admire, from uh, their failures. They, they learn from their failures and don't let those failures to name them. No, and um, they are aware that there are people with more talent and uh, innate abilities, but they believe that these are not essential at all. So unlike those with a fixed mindset, uh, they do like to hear criticism and they are okay failing because they do not think this as something that defines them. They think this as something temporary that, that criticism or that failures, it because of the specific moment in time or specific um, you know, knowledge that they don't possess at that moment in time. It's not about who they are. And, and they value effort, you know, because they know that this is the best way to learn something. Phrases like, I can tell you've tried hard, or you will need to work more on this to get better greatly influence in, in creating this uh, growth mindset. How will you know, you know, how can you easily detect if you are in a growth mindset or a fixed mindset? Well, think about these five areas, like for example, ch challenges. How, how do you approach challenges? You know, a growth mindset will embrace the challenge while a fixed mindset will avoid it, right? Um, obstacles, growth mindset, you know, will persist through it. You know, it's, it's going to be an, uh, uh, over and over uh, all the obstacles, they will find a way to overcome them. While a fixed mindset, after a few obstacles, they will just give up. Uh, the effort, well, the effort is just, it's just the path to mastery and, and they know it's a process and, and they behave as such, you know, and um, a fixed mindset, the effort, they, they will be focused on the effort, the endeavor, instead of the final goal. Um, when it comes to criticism, you, you will see then that they are there, you know, interested in the learning from it. Uh, while a fixed mindset, you know, uh, dismiss it, uh, ignores it, and you know, get gets upset with with the person giving them the the feedback or or that criticism, they will actually ignore not not just ignore but avoid you know such moments to to get the feedback. And 
growth mindset people, you will see that they seek mentorship. They, they look up to people that inspire them and, and they are constantly uh, looking at our experience, learn from our experience, people's experience. While a fixed mindset, uh, it's well. Actually, they they feel jealous of our people, and and they even feel threatened by the success of ours. Working with someone with a fixed mindset, it's a um, constant and exa exhausting struggle. Um, well, studies have shown that. One is not born with a certain mentality, but it's something acquired. And we can have a growth mindset in one aspect of our life while having a fixed mindset and another aspect, for example, at work. This is good because it means that it's something that is in our power to change. We can choose to have a growth mindset and transforms ourselves as a person. Every employer wants to have in their team people with growth mindset. Why? Because you know they believe that they can achieve anything, <laughs> and they can tackle challenge, and they learn, and, and they add value in everything they do. I, I remember my my mentor Jeff Holtz, a person that I respect a lot and a great businessman, once told me. If you learn from a mistake, that learning becomes an asset. If you do not learn from it, you have, you've wasted an, an opportunity. So no wonder that people with a growth mindset are people successful in life. So in summary, um, five characteristics of uh, value-driven professionals they add value in everything they do. They take ownership and accountability. They solve problems. They don't create them. They set and achieve goals and they adopt a growth mindset. I've uh, put here a list of free books for you if you are interested to dig in deeper into all these concepts that we discussed today. Um, the book mindset that um, I mentioned uh, before by uh, Carol Dweck. Um, Business Made Simple um, by uh, uh, Donald Miller. Uh, it, he talks uh, extensively about uh, value driven professionals. And uh, Nonviolent Communication, uh, it's a book by Marshall Rosenberg, um, a book that will help you to communicate assertive uh, in an assertive way while not hurting other people's feelings. And um, I hope this these books will give you a broader perspective of, of what the value, how a, what and how a value-driven professional thinks and behaves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina, for the talk. That was absolutely amazing. And you gave awesome points on how to be more valuable to the industry. Um, so again, thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, this will be our Q&A time. So please feel free to ask in the Q&A function of Zoom. Um, in the meantime, I have a question for you, Christina. Mm -hmm. What is the best way to take the first step of going into that growth mindset from a fixed mindset, since that's an issue I struggle with personally? Well, first of all, when you, when in, in, in the moment when you have to, you know, you find yourself in a situation, um, analyze the space you are in. So where are you coming from? So are you avoiding facing a situation? Um, are you uh, seeing you know, the obstacles that uh, come your way? Are you inclined to give up? Um, is, is the endeavor you know, too hard? Are you perceiving it as too hard? And, and um, uh, you, again, want to give up. Um, is somebody giving you feedback and are you inclined to dismiss it? Um, 
or you know you you're feeling threatened by by somebody next to you that is successful then you are in this fixed mindset you know i um i remember uh in my first years as a manager i um was in a fixed mindset um the um, I received the feedback from a colleague about my leadership. So I, I was very good at managing things, right? Getting things done. And I was very focused on that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm uh, very, uh, you know, task oriented, not so much people oriented, but get the, the stuff done. That was my focus. And um, I received this feedback from the person telling me that uh, my leadership is, is not so great, that people didn't really like to work with me. But um, my reaction to that was to ignore it. Mm. And, and I did ignore it. Um, I, um, I, it came from a person that I was not respecting too much. And uh, because of that, I said, well, no, this person tells me just to hurt my feelings. And um, two years after that, now working at a different company, um, I received kind of the same feedback from somebody who I respected a lot. And I actually believed that was a very good engineer and uh, was actually my, my right hand. I really trusted the guy. And he came to me and told me that, um, that he feels that there is nothing that can uh, uh, satisfy, uh, uh, satisfy me. I'm always criticizing his work and he's feeling even, uh, you know, uh, doubting himself when he's around me. Hmm. And, and, and that's when I realized that my leadership was a toxic leadership. I, I may be, maybe I was very effective at getting things done, but I really didn't pay attention to how that uh, affected people around me and that I was not inspiring them uh, and uh, while well, they, they didn't enjoy their work. Um, that was a great wake up call for me. And that's when I realized, hey, this is not who I wanna be. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's when I started learning about emotional intelligence, uh, about uh, mindfulness and, um, uh, you know, self-understanding uh, uh, who I am and how, how my beliefs are affecting the way I behave and, and the impact that I have on people. Mm -hmm. um, it was a great transformation in my career and, and in the way I now see the, um, the, you know, the work, how, how we should get things done. It's no longer about the, the things that we have to do. It's more about the journey and how we get to achieve what we set ourselves to achieve. So it, it did help to see where was I when in the moment that I received that feedback to understand that uh, yes, it hurt my emotions, right? I, I, I really felt like it, it was a pain when I received that feedback. Yeah. Um, however, I, I realized that person did not tell me, did not give me the feedback with the purpose to hurt me. It really gave me the feedback because he was uh, feeling like that about our relationship. And, and that's when it was a decision for me to start to to transform myself. So moving from fixed mindset to growth mindset, it's a decision. It's in our hands to do it. You know, you can control it, but you have to understand where are you coming from and what are you feeling um, about the situation or about what you, what the people told you mm. and acknowledge that, right? You, you cannot ignore it, acknowledge it and focused, okay, how can I learn from this? How can I, how can I change this, right? So again, you know, courage, it's not, um, uh, courage, it doesn't mean you are not afraid of things. Uh, courage, it means that despite being afraid, you act. So despite being hurt that my colleague didn't like to work with yeah. me, you know, 
it's it's despite that let's act and let's fix that and mm. be open to transform yourself and understand that you are a person in in evolution you are constantly evolving and maybe now you are here but if you set yourself to transform to, to learn something new uh, maybe at the personal level or maybe it's technology or you know uh, 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 skills but that will help you over time to get to a better place yeah that definitely makes sense thank you um, so we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, so May is asking, I've experienced with people who always want to be right. They utilize their confirmation bias to support their argument. How do you deal with people who always want to be right and not change their mind at work? We have just a warning. We have 10 minutes more in our hour. So um, yeah, if you'd like to answer that. Yeah, so... To understand that, you have to understand that people that want to be right, it's, um, it's a form of coping with, um, of coping with fears. And they want to dominate. Um, it's not about going and facing, confronting them that, oh, you are right, uh, oh, you are not right, you are wrong. And if you do that, you will obtain the opposite reaction, right? You will create a conflict because that person is going to go deeper into defending their opinion or their, their idea. When dealing with these people, uh, you have to acknowledge that their idea, it, it is, a good idea and invite them to see if there are other ideas that we can try you know um so on one side a knowledge that they thought of something that they they their idea is valid and invite them to think of other ideas of other options um <laughs> uh thinking about um uh, jeff holtz my my mentor i remember that um he always told us that um, if you have just one way of solving something, one option, you are a slave to that option. If you have two options to solve something, then you have a choice. But if you have three options, you have freedom because now you can look at the different advantages and disadvantages and actually choose the better approach. So I, in conclusion, when talking to people that they always wanna be right, well, acknowledge them that their idea or what they propose, uh, it is a good idea and it is a good valid option and invite them to think how to be free, you know, how to have options, really options that you can actually look at the, at the better uh, and choose a better approach. Don't, how not to be a slave to one idea and one course of action. That's what I would do. Thank you so much, um, May. I hope that answers your question. If anyone else has any other questions, we have about seven minutes for that. Um, Kristen uh, said a comment on what we were talking about earlier with my question. She said, I feel like feedback from those I respect does make more of an impact. And I notice it the other direction as well when I give feedback to others. I think that's why, even though it's hard, it is most important to give constructive criticism to those that we have a good relationship with. Yeah. Yeah, so um, as, as you mentioned, uh, having a good relationship, uh, it's, it's very important. And what does that mean? Because in a work, uh, in the work uh, uh, environment, you know, you will not be friends with everybody at work. The, what is important is for the people to feel, when, when you give the feedback, the people to feel that they were heard, seen, and understood. 
Why? Because if you tell them something, but they feel that, yeah, you are just saying that, but you really don't understand them, they will dismiss your feedback and they will take it as criticism. But if you take your time to really understand why they did that, how they are, what was their thinking when they did that? You know, and, and really come from a place where you seek to understand and, and acknowledge that that person, you know, it's, it's there, it's, it's not just an object. When you give your time to understand them, they will be much open to receiving your um, even constructive uh, uh, criticism, right? because they will feel that it comes from somebody who does understand them. It's not just judging them. That, that's the thing with criticism or with feedback. F people feel judged and they feel judged at the personal level, at their identity. And, and um, that's why it's so important when you give, it, give the feedback, take your time to understand the other person and let that other person, you know, even justify their, their thinking that they, why they behave in a certain way and, and um, get to a point where that person feels understood and then give the feedback. Thank you. We have one last question from Kristen and we have five minutes remaining, but uh, Kristen is asking, I feel like I am trying to balance between different commitments in order to take more ownership of less commitments. I feel like I should take on less commitments. In your experience, does taking on less commitments to take more ownership work out better in the long run or worse? Hmm. Well, that, that's an interesting question and um, it depends a lot if you are in a position of leadership, I mean, you have a team and you take more ownership, what it actually means is that you have to invest more in your team, grow that team. And when you grow that team, you can delegate things to them so you can take on new uh, challenges or new responsibilities. Actually, that is key to becoming a great manager, building your team, investing more in your team so they, they can um, you know, become as independent as possible from you and you can take on more responsibilities and grow as a leader. Now, the other side, if you do not have anybody, uh, so you don't, uh, uh, you don't have a team uh, and you do want to take more ownership. Now, the, what I would invite you to look into is how can you be more effective with your time? Um, time management techniques, uh, uh, although I have some mixed feelings with time management um, in, in the sense that, yeah, become much more effective of, of managing your agenda of what you do and in what do you spend your time, you know, so um, major time, if you are spending it on, um, not important things, then, you know, you are kind of wasting it. Um, and uh, I, I would invite you to think about how can you be um, more valuable uh, and, and make more valuable that unit of time. So how can you achieve more in the same unit of time? And, um, generate more value to whatever project you are working on. Thank you. Um, yeah, Kristen said, thank you in the chat. Delegation was an option I was wondering about. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that will be the end of our talk. 
Um, thank you so much again, Christina, for spending your time with us today and giving us all these important tips and resources to better ourselves and increase our value in the tech and CS field. And not only tech and CS, but any field actually, since they're so applicable to every single aspect of a career. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you again for your time. And it was an honor to have you today. Thank you guys for giving me this opportunity. I hope this is helping you and, and uh, giving you a new perspective on how to become a more valuable um, professional. Of course. Uh, also, some people in the chat were wondering if they could have that presentation that you talked about earlier. Is there of any way? Yes, please uh, write me. These are my um, contact information. Uh, write me uh, LinkedIn or at my uh, codex site uh, email, Desco email, and uh, I will uh, provide you the link. Great. Thank you so much again, Christina. Have a okay. great day, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.